Over the past decade, the importance of sleep has rapidly made its way to the forefront of importance for our well-being. That attention has been accompanied by a plethora of apps, books, articles, and so much more to provide us with all the tools and knowledge to improve our sleep. But what happens when none of those work? What happens when you try all the tools, follow all the advice, and still can't seem to get a good night's sleep? Today, we're going to answer that question as internationally recognized behavior sleep medicine specialist and author Dr. Jade Wu walks us through the step-by-step process of overcoming insomnia, sleeping pills, and the angst that many of us feel as night approaches and we wonder if tonight will just be a rehashing of our prior struggles. She's also going to do a sample CBT session with me as the guinea pig toward the end of this episode so you can get a flavor of how this whole process works. Welcome to the Catalyst 360 Podcast, your trusted source for engaging evidence-based health, wellness, and performance insights each and every week since 2018. I'm your host, Dr. Brad Cooper of Catalyst Coaching 360, and if you struggle with sleep over the years, I'm right there on the journey with you. While I haven't gone down the sleep meds path, I have tried just about everything else. Room temperature, sleep schedules, eye covers, sleep bud, earplugs, fueling adjustments, caffeine restrictions, and more. They made a difference, but I continue to go through notable rough patches with my sleep. Maybe you're there with me. Maybe you or someone close to you is wondering if it'll always be that way. If so, today's discussion with Dr. Jade Wu, author of the brand new book, Hello Sleep, might be a life-changing episode. While she will touch on the latest sleep hygiene guidelines, most of our conversation focuses on something called CBTI, or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, and the actual step-by-step process of how we can utilize that approach to improve our sleep. Before we jump into the interview, I want to briefly speak to the health and wellness coaches in our audience. If you haven't yet registered for the Rocky Mountain Coaching Retreat and Symposium in Estes Park, Colorado this September, please get registered now. I'm not saying this to boost our revenue. Those of you who have attended in the past know that the combined event and housing cost is about half of most wellness-related conferences. And with the limit we put on registration, it's not unusual for us to lose money on the event. But we continue to move forward with this because that's not our purpose with this one. It is the longest-running retreat and symposium dedicated to supporting the well-being and education of health and wellness coaches. You will make some new friends, you'll garner some new tools, and perhaps most importantly you'll return home refreshed, rejuvenated, and remembering why we do what we do. Please, coaches, get registered today. It will fill up. All the details under the retreat tab at catalystcoachinginstitute.com. There is a six-month no-interest payment and a group discount if you're coming with peers or team members. Like I said, it will fill up. You need this. Your employer, clients, family need you to be there. Questions? Happy to talk through details. There's a video about the last couple of years' events. Really an incredible weekend together. Email us anytime, results at catalystcoaching360.com. And now, it's time to learn how any of us can improve our sleep through the use of CBT with Dr. Jade Wu on the latest episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast. All right, let's do this. Dr. Wu, what a privilege. Uh, We were talking a little bit offline. Your new book, Hello Sleep, I've read so much about sleep, and we'll talk about why that is later, but it's unique. It's different. And it's effective. So really happy to have you join us today. Thanks for coming on the Cattle 360 podcast. Oh my gosh. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So a lot of great guests. I think we've had seven when I went back and looked at it on the Cattle 360 podcast talking about sleep, but you're the Mm -hmm. first to talk about cognitive behavioral therapy or people may know it as CBT as being the, the, that key. What, Mm -hmm. what took you down that path? And can you give our listeners who may be going CB what? A 10,000 foot (laughs) view of of what that actually is. Sure. Yeah. So my background originally in my clinical psychology training is actually in mood disorders and anxiety disorders. So I got my sort of earned my wings in clinical psychology by working with folks who have panic disorder, anxiety disorders, depression. So I'm very familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy from that lens. And really what it is, is changing your behaviors and your thought patterns. And when it comes to sleep, CBT for insomnia is really about changing your relationship with sleep. So the way you act around sleep, the way you think about sleep, how you talk to yourself about sleep, how (laughs) you place sleep as a thing in your life, like where, what place does it take in your life? So that's what CBT for insomnia is all about. 
It's so interesting. And even looking at the cover of your book and, and folks, you got to get this book. I'm just going to tell you, we don't usually, <laughs> we, so we, we always mention books, but we don't usually go overboard like I'm going now, but I just, even your cover, there's a smiley face on it. Aww. And, and, <laughs> and that's what people like me and a lot of people listening need because we look at sleep as, okay, here we go again. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I don't know what's going to happen tonight. It's probably the same old thing. So yeah. even the design of your cover is, is a lot of fun. So walk us through s with sleep. How, what role does CBD play? You, you've introduced it, but kind of walk us into that process. And, and I mentioned in the intro that we're going to do a mini session at the end so people can see yeah. that come to life. But just walk sure. us through kind of how CBT happens. And then I'll ask you about the actual steps here in a minute. So more broadly here, and then we'll go into some of the key steps to integrate. Yeah, sounds great. So when we do CBT for insomnia, it's for someone who has had insomnia for at least a couple of months. So it's mostly for people with chronic insomnia. And so that means someone who has trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up too early, just feeling really not good about the quality or quantity of their sleep. And it's you know, been happening for at least a couple of months. It's bothering them. Uh, they're concerned. It's impacting how they function or feel during the day. So, you know, this is someone who probably has tried some other things for sleep already. Like they've doubled down on sleep hygiene. They've done the research, you know, about what should my bedroom be like, or what sh should I do? And shouldn't I do? And by the time they get to me, usually they, they're like, I throw my hands up. I don't know what else to try here. I'm really like, I'm just about to give up or I've already given up, but you know, whatever, let's try this. Um, so that's, that's usually who I'm working with when I do CBTI and the way I work with folks and thank you for drawing attention to this theme in my book is I just really love the idea that, you know, sleep should not feel like a chore. It's not an engineering problem. It's not a big project that you have to manage. You know, it should be just a friend. Sleep mm -hmm. is your friend, something mm -hmm. that you feel really comfortable with and look forward to hang out with. And it's like, it's an enjoyable and something you get to look, uh, look something in your life you get to look forward to. Um, but you're right. By the time people have had insomnia for a while, it's like, well, here we go. How's, you know, let's do battle tonight. Um, so I really want to help people change that mindset. And the way we do that is by changing the way we relate to sleep. Mm. Like, first of all, understanding what sleep and insomnia really are, because there's so many misconceptions out there. Mm. And with the, on upon that foundation, we can change maybe the way we think about sleep, like, uh, examining whether our expectations are a little bit too rigid or mm. maybe our expectations are unrealistic or maybe our expectations are realistic, but we're putting too much pressure on ourselves to meet that expectation tonight, like right now. Um, and the th way that we maybe act around sleep, like sometimes people go to bed too early because they're trying to make up for a bad night last night. How understandable is that, right? But then unfortunately, that can sometimes backfire and make it even harder to fall asleep. So it's things like that, picking out, um, you know, the patterns that we see and how people relate to their sleep and removing those unhelpful barriers out of the way to allow someone's natural sleep to come forth. Because, you know, sleep is a very foundational, fundamental biological process, like breathing, eating, drinking water. The body really does want to sleep. And your brain knows how to sleep. Mm. If we just get this other stuff out of the way, your body will get back to doing what it does best. Do you think the, so sleep has garnered huge attention. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the name of the doc that came out? Uh, he's Matt Walker. Cal yeah, Matt's book. Um, so that brought to our attention, stop saying I'll sleep and I'm dead. Stop <laughs> sure. cutting short. You know, you need your seven to eight hours, blah, 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 blah. Do you think that has for especially the type A folks, many of whom are listening, um, everyone, um, do you think it's turned it into, as you said, a, a chore? Like, a, a, I'm going to instead, uh, okay, I'm going to do my intervals on the track today, and I'm going to get my seven hours and 42 minutes of sleep. Has, it, has that made it worse for those personality types? That's such a great question, because I think, um, hmm. How do I put this? I feel like it's so great that we all are paying more attention mm. to sleep. I'm so grateful to Matt Walker for bringing sleep under the spotlight and everyone now cares about it. And I think the way we care about it is maybe not 
as nuanced as it needs to be as a public. Right now, our attention is just on get more sleep yes. or else you'll die. You yes. know, that's the kind or of have message dementia, floating out there. You'll have whatever. Yeah, exactly. And I think some, a lot of people do need a bit of a kick in the butt to be like, okay, this is something you need to start you know, giving yourself the time to do the sleep thing is really important. Um, but you're right. There's a lot of uh, people like me, like you are type A folks who really want to do things right. And they've done all of their other aspects of health, right? They go to the gym, they eat well, they pay attention to their whatever, they meditate. Mm -hmm. But sleep is one thing where you cannot just work harder and get better at it, uh. right? <laughs> I know, it's so frustrating. I, I wish I could just say, okay, follow this detailed like... Um, uh, you know, regimen. Right. And I guarantee your sleep will be better. That's not really how it works because sleep, you know, like I said, sleep is a friend, but she's a shy friend. She will run away if you become too overbearing. Mm. So this mm. over tracking, especially now that we have all these sleep trackers that can be very helpful, but if you overdo it, then sleep is like, oh my gosh, you're putting me under the microscope. What's going on? And that's actually adding mm. more pressure and more anxiety. And that doesn't help you know, the type A folks who have insomnia, which is the, kind of the ideal clientele that I see. Shy friend. That is a great phrase. Wow. That's so memorable. Yeah. And, and when you picture mm -hmm. it that way, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. But dial it back a little <laughs> bit. Uh, the expectations sure. you mentioned, I, I, I did see a study where they basically tricked people. They said, hey, you got nine hours of sleep when they actually got seven. And they told other people, you got five hours of sleep when they actually got seven. And right. their response <laughs> that day was similar to what they thought, not what they got. Is mm -hmm. that, does that play a role in this too, in terms of where CBT can be a benefit? Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think there's such a big psychological component to this. Not to say that insomnia is not real or that it's like all in your head. That's not what I mean. Uh, I just mean that how you feel during the day depends on so many factors. Mm -hmm. And we often put all of the uh, either blame or, uh, you know, the credit on sleep. It's yes. like, well, I feel great today. Yes. I must have gotten a great night of sleep or I feel terrible today. It must have been because I didn't sleep well. But if you really look at other factors, like what's my mood today? Am I overstimulated? Am I understimulated? Am I bored? Am I stressed? Am I dehydrated? Have I not laughed for a few days? Have I not talked to my friends or family? You know, there's so many factors that play into how you feel during the day. And one of the big factors is how you feel about your sleep. Mm. So if you're really stressed out and thinking, crap, I didn't get good sleep. I'm going to be really awful today and tired, non-functioning. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because then you do feel crappy and tired and, and like bummed out. Whereas if you go into it thinking, well, shoot, I only got five hours, but whatever that's happened before I've gone through it. I have an exciting day coming up. Usually people rally pretty well, even if they didn't get as much sleep as they wanted to. I'm laughing for two reasons. One, <laughs> people that know my wife and myself know that she's good with whatever. She's like, didn't have a great sleep. Doesn't matter. I'm fine. And uh -huh. for me, it's like, you can ask me first thing in the morning, Brad, how was your sleep? And you're going to know how my day goes. Because So we'll get, uh, it, we'll get yeah. into that later. So, <laughs> and then the other thing is interesting is my PhD work. One of our research studies, we looked at functional mental toughness based on oh. sleep patterns. So we restrict, we did a sleep restriction and then we did uh -huh. an excess sleep and people did what you're describing. The, the people that the, the lack of sleep did not influence their FMT or functional mental toughness made uh -huh. other adjustments in their life that allowed them to maintain that FMT. Whereas those that were very dependent upon or focused on sleep, mm. theirs dropped because they, so anyway, it, it's really interesting to see That's all these really pieces cool come study. together. Yeah, it, was, it yeah. was pretty cool. All right. So during the reset phase, you want us mm -hmm. to use the daytime hours to, to be more sleepy at night. What a concept. Uh, <laughs> now it sounds like that avoid, avoid naps, uh, avoid sleeping in, Avoid, and this one was weird for me, and maybe we'll talk about this, but early bedtimes. I've been staying up later since I've read your book. Awesome. And, which my wife is glad about because she always went to bed being nice to me. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, and, and I, frankly, I was cursing you one day when I really could have used a nap <laughs> because I felt like I'm at 50% and I would normally grab a nap here. And 
But and, and you're not against naps. Let's clarify, everybody. You're not against I'm naps not at all. Against naps. It's just during that reset phase that you want to avoid those. Can you walk us through people that haven't yet read your book? Can you walk us through the different phases and what things might be different in this phase versus that phase? Yes. So the big reset is the big first big push that we make for people with insomnia. And the whole concept of the big reset is uh, based on the competition between two forces within you that determine whether you're going to be sleepy or not. So on the, on the one side, we have sleep drive, which is like your hunger for sleep. You know, the longer you're awake and the more active you are, the more sleep drive you save up, like sleepiness coins and your uh, sleepiness Piggy, uh, excuse me, sleeping is piggy bank. And then on the other side, we have arousal. So anything that revs up body or mind. And if you have too much arousal, even if you have enough sleep drive, that arousal is going to be overriding that sleep drive. So we want to increase your sleep drive, decrease your arousal. And the big reset is kind of the big first big push to tip that balance in your favor. So first of all, in order to increase your sleep drive, we have to have you be awake longer, awake and out of bed, right? So mm. that's why um, no napping. That's why no sleeping in in the morning. That's why going to bed later. We're basically buying you more time to be awake and upright and out of bed and doing stuff to be saving up sleep drive. Now, this phase is not forever. You're not doing the big reset for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's usually like two to four weeks at most. So rest assured, this is not forever. It's really almost like a like a boot camp to make you extra sleepy. Yeah, like we're almost sleep phrase. depriving you slightly. Yeah. Yeah. So that jacks up your sleep drive. Um, and at the same time, what we want to avoid is spending too much awake time in bed, because anytime you're awake in bed, especially if you're frustrated and anxious and thinking about how mm. little sleep you're getting yeah, yeah. in bed, your brain is mo making that association between bed and awake and frustrated and anxious and all of those bad stuff, bad things. So, you know, your brain is so good at putting two and two together that we don't want it to make that association long term. So we're going to break that association. If you're not happy and relaxed and sleeping in bed, then you're going to be out of bed doing something else. So that's the what the big reset boils down to. Um, now, by the end of the big reset or like through the middle of it, maybe a couple of weeks in, by this time you're sleepy. You're probably like maybe accidentally taking a nap, you know? Um, so that's good. We're reacquainting your brain with a feeling of sleepiness, forcing your brain to um, really make the most out of the time that you have in bed to fill it up with good quality sleep. Now, as that's happening, the next phase that kind of overlaps with a big a reset is to start playing with the with your conceptions and your ideas about sleep. So we're starting to ask questions like, well, you know, what are your expectations for how much you sleep and when you mm. sleep? Um, like, for example, how much sleep do you feel like you need? Uh, I go off the eight hours. I, you know, we try to in the past try to be a in bed by 9.30 and I like to get up about 5.30 and get rolling. So, but yeah. as we'll talk about later, the sleep efficiency piece has mm -hmm. not been something I've done a good job of focusing on. I've been looking yeah. more at TIB or time in bed. Yes, right. So to explain sleep efficiency, that's of the time that you're in bed trying to sleep, how much of that time are you actually filling with right. sleep? So generally we want 85% or to like a 90-ish percent, um, 85 to 95 is kind of the sweet spot. Right. So that would mean the vast majority of time you're in bed, you're sleeping, not a hundred percent, because that would mean your head hits a pillow and you're out like a light or out like a dead log mm -hmm. until your alarm wakes you up, that would mean you're not getting enough opportunity to sleep and you're too sleep deprived. So 85 to 95 is what we're looking for. Um, and so it sounds like you've been focusing more on making sure you have at least the eight hours in bed and like a pretty early window too, 930 to 530. Mm -hmm. um, and then just kind of hoping that your brain will fill that window with 
good sleep efficiency. Hoping is a good right? phrase. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wonder how you came up with the 930 bedtime. Like what was that based on? I think it was reverse engineered. I, I love that 530 for me. If I can be up and rolling at that uh-huh. point, I'm a very, very much a morning person. So I like okay. to be up Great. and at them and journal and pray and meditate cool. and think about stuff and then write into my exercise and then write into work. So mm-hmm. if I delay that by even 45 minutes, I feel like I'm catching up all day long. So I think it was okay. reverse engineered from, I, mm-hmm. I want to be going at 5.30. So that means 9.30. Mm-hmm. And Susanna's just been very kind to say, okay, that sounds fine. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a perfectly reasonable way of doing it. If you don't have insomnia and you don't have trouble with sleep, but if you find, do you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep? It's the staying asleep more so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the, here's, so here's how I like to think about it. You know, let's say you're making a pizza from scratch and this is how much dough you have. Mm-hmm. And this is how much dough you've earned throughout the day by being active and awake. You know, um, if you try to make a pizza, that's too big, then you're going to have holes in your mm-hmm. crust. There's just not enough dough to go yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. Right. So instead of making a huge pizza, what if we make a smaller pizza, at least for now, just focusing on the quality of the crust and having that nice and thick Chicago deep dish, you know, like, you know, the quality. And then um, your brain will have much less trouble filling up that time, the small amount of time with good quality sleep. And once your sleep quality is good, then it's easier to maybe work on figuring out what's the ideal amount of sleep that you need. And that may be eight hours or maybe more, maybe less. Right. Right. Yeah. So then right. like, then we're working with your body instead of against. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let's talk about Dr. Carney's app that she's done for the VA. Uh, she, yeah. she joined us in episode 171. I had no idea of the two of yours connection prior to reading your book. So it was kind of fun to see that sleep app is is that right the consensus sleep diary and possibly the cbti coach app as that's, well that's she's, what it is. Yes. yeah she's probably worked on yeah. more than one of these yeah, yeah. so folks she's you can you fantastic. can look it up if you want to pull mm-hmm. it up i've been using it for the last three or four weeks since reading her book but based on that can you walk us through how either using the journal that you provide in the book or the sleep app that you suggest why that's so important Yeah. So one of the foundations of doing CBTI is doing the sleep diary. So that's basically self-monitoring, keeping track of your sleep behaviors, like when you go to bed, how long it's taking you to fall asleep, how many times you're waking up at night, um, things like that. And this is important because, first of all, you need to understand something before you can change it. Right. So we need to know where we're starting at. And it's so cool how much information you can gather from looking at a week or ideally two weeks worth of sleep diaries. There's um, patterns that emerge that you would never have guessed. Like, wow, look at that. Every day you're like trending a little later with your bedtime. um, And then you're like sleeping in by a couple hours on the weekends. What's up with that? Like Mm -hmm. maybe we have a delayed sleep phase thing going on here where someone is uh, biologically, um, hardwired night owl and they're trying to be a morning person but they they're fighting against you know their natural rhythms and they're kind of slipping 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 towards being a night owl so that would be a very different insomnia than someone who is a morning person but they are uh, waking up too early you know they're um i had a client recently who was like why am i waking up at 4 a.m every day i want to wake up at 5 30 that's already pretty early but what's with the 4 a.m i'm like well what do you do when you wake up at 4 a.m he's like well i drink a couple five hour energies immediately <laughs> and then and i mean to him it was like well i'm up so i might as well start my day and the way i start my day is by having you know a couple of boosts of energy and it's like well that sounds very reasonable from her, his perspective but then circadian rhythm wise oh, now we see that all the weekdays you're waking up at four, weekends you're sleeping until six. um, And it's because you don't drink the five-hour energy on weekends and your body has learned the pattern of weekday versus weekend. Mm. So, you know, having the sleep diary really gives us a sense of the bigger picture of patterns over time. Um, 
And sometimes people ask, well, can't I just wear my Apple Watch or my Fitbit and give you my data that way? And yes, that could be really interesting and helpful data to have. But what I really want to know is your perception of your sleep. Because I want to know how much you felt like you were awake during the night. Because Interestingly, for people with insomnia, especially, that's often different from what actually happened during the night. So if we have both diary data and sleep tracker data, we can actually compare and contrast and see, oh, maybe you actually got more sleep than you thought you did. And how can we sort of figure out why is it that you felt like you were awake for two straight hours? Um, you know, could it be that your anxiety about sleep and the way you're hypervigilant to feeling like you're awake during the night is making it feel like you're awake that whole time. Mm. Whereas you maybe woke up a few times during that time, slept in between, but your brain kind of strung together those awakenings into one long awakening. So anyway, now I'm getting into like probably too much detail. But no, I think that's yeah. good. Cause as you're saying that I'm nodding my head saying, yeah, that's, I, and I'm, I know I'm not alone in, in, in feeling mm -hmm. that way. So I think you're accurate with that. Um, Okay, so you're you're big on don't look at the clock in the middle of the night. Sure, but yes. then we're trying to get one of the things we have to fill out in the morning in the journal or the app is how long were you awake those two or three or four or whatever number of times. Yeah. I, I think I'm I, I'm having trouble going, well, ten minutes, I don't know, twenty minutes. It felt like a long time, maybe forty. So any tips with that in terms of how to pro I know you're not looking for exact minutes. That's not the point of the exercise. Mm -hmm but just some general tips in terms of recalling without staring at a clock, recalling mm -hmm. how long I think I was awake those various times? Great question. So I would say the idea is actually to not try too hard to be precise. Okay. You don't have to be precise. Again, the point is to see how much sleep or awakening you perceived, you felt like. Got so it. if you're like, oh, I'm not sure if it was 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I mean, that's okay. That's what a good sleeper does is they don't really think about it much. And if you really probe them, they'll be like, I guess I woke up a couple of times. Maybe it was 10 minutes, maybe not. Um, but the whole point is we don't actually need to, nor do we want to know precisely how much you were awake. Everybody wakes up during the night, you know, 10 to 16 times is very normal. And we don't remember most of those. And sometimes we are awake a little bit longer to go to the bathroom, drink water. You know, we're kind of like skimming sleep, maybe, especially in the morning hours for a chunk of it. That's okay. Sleep is not black or white on or off. So there is going to be some gray area where we're not sure about. And that's okay. That's where a lot of the improvement with CBTI comes is feeling relaxed enough about sleep that mm. you're not really sure how much you were awake and mm. it doesn't really matter. Nice. I, yeah. I did remember that 10 to 16 times a night stat from your book, because I, I think if people know that, so folks, what she's saying is we all generally wake up 10 to 16 times a night. We just, we don't remember most of them. Mm -hmm. So that, that takes so much, I don't know, it changes the expectations. It, 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 let you relax and go, I woke up and so did every person in the world. Yeah. And I'm going to probably wake up nine or 10 more times tonight and not realize half yeah. them. So I loved you including that stat in there. Um, one of the things that you talk about is bed is only for sleep and sex. I've been trying to follow that more so, but then <sighs> your 4 a.m. example is a great one. And I'll, uh -huh. I'll wake up, I'll be like, well, I'm, I'm feeling okay, maybe I should, I'll peek at the clock. It's 4 a.m. Do I, stay? when I get in bed, I start doing the math and I start thinking, well, yeah. how long should I lay here? Because if I lay here for 30 minutes and then I get up and try to reset, then it's, you know, 4.50 or whatever. So the mm -hmm. math starts taking over. Do, do you recommend the late morning sleepers just don't, uh, late morning or well, wakers, don't, uh -huh. don't just, don't even go back to bed, pop up, stay up for 10 minutes and then go back or any thoughts with that late morning, maybe the bathroom wakes you up, whatever it might be. But for some reason, it's your 4 a.m. person who doesn't go for the five-hour energy. They're wanting to get that extra hour and a half, two hours of sleep. What mm -hmm. then? Do you, do you just skip it? Do you skip it during the reset phase? Or do you go back to bed and do your best for a few minutes? What do you, <laughs> what do you think? Okay, so Brad, before I fully answer that question, may I please gently note how much effort 
oh, you I'm just put hard. into. <laughs> yeah, you're working hard. And that hard work, that mental gymnastics, is that helping you to feel sleepy or relaxed at 4 a.m.? Oh, it's so relaxing, Dr. Wu. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're it dead is. on. You are dead on. No doubt. So, so what I would say, there's. I'll give a two-part answer to your question. The first part is don't work so hard. If you are like doing math in your head, that means you're working too hard. Go by your feeling instead. Okay. If you are wide awake and like bored and frustrated, anxious, then don't do that in bed. We don't want the bed to be a bored, frustrated, anxious place. Get up and yeah, do something else. Or, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, or, you know, if the bed is cozy and it's cold the rest of the house and you don't want to get physically get out of bed, that's fine. Sit up and read a book, play on your phone. Just do something enjoyable. Like imagine if you suddenly magically had an extra hour of me time during the day, what would you do with that time? Hmm. And whatever the answer is for that, I mean, see if you can do that at at night. So that's the first part of my answer is just don't worry too much about it. And the second part is this is why I don't want people watching the clock because then they because people have connotations attached to each hour of the night. It's like if you wake up and see like midnight, you feel probably one way whereas if you wake up and see the clock is 4 a.m., you feel another way. Mm, absolutely. But why does it matter? Mm -hmm. It's still the night. Right. You're not going to start your day at right. either midnight or 4 a.m. Right. It makes functionally no difference to what your actions at that time or how your decision making goes should be. So why know the time? If you've already set your alarm for the morning and you know you're not going to oversleep your obligations, then it doesn't. It really doesn't matter what time it is. And so why don't we just take that variable off the table completely and just not worry about it? Well, and I like what you said about feelings, making the decision based on the feelings, not the time or the calculation yeah. or any of the other things. If, if the, yeah, that was outstanding. Um, let's, I don't want to spend a lot of time on sleep hygiene because that is kind of the, the, it's become the status quo. Most people know that, but do you have a mm -hmm. few favorites? You, you mentioned a few, you mentioned caffeine, you mentioned some of the blue light blocking glasses. Are there some of your mm -hmm. favorites that you feel like bubble to the top consistently with some of your clients that folks might yeah. want to try while they're doing these other things? Yeah. Um, caffeine is definitely one of them. I think, uh, I think caffeine can be very tricky because when you have insomnia and you feel crappy about your sleep, you feel crappy during the day, you're tired. It's, it's very understandable to want to reach for caffeine to cope with that tiredness. But then that caffeine ends up feeding into the problem because either it stays in your system a long time and, you know, it interferes with your nighttime sleep, or it makes you more tired during the day because it's forcing your body to run on fake fuel, mm. essentially, right? It's like, it's tricking your body it's into- a credit card. It, exactly. That's a great way of putting it. And then the more you owe on the credit card, the more you're going to have to pay later. So often people are saying, oh my gosh, my insomnia is making me so tired. And I'm like, is it really the insomnia that's making you tired? Or is the fact, is it the fact that you drink like eight coffee, uh, coffees a day that's actually making you tired? So often, you know, just shaving down the coffee, decreasing it by like 25%, 50% can go a real long way. Mm. So, and it's so individual how long coffee right. lasts in each person's right. system. So very different. Yeah, totally. So why don't, you know, like, why not kind of try decreasing the caffeine a little bit and see if that helps um, take the edge off. So there's that piece I, I really like. And, um, and just to clarify on that one, yeah. uh, because most people have maybe a time limit where they say, I'm not going to drink it after 12 or after two, or mm -hmm. you're, you're saying, sure, that's valuable. But you also are saying, try 25% less total. <laughs> Even if you are a nothing after 10 a.m. person, mm -hmm. maybe try 25 or 50% less and see if that has an influence. Absolutely. Because it's not just like, it's possible that if you cut off your caffeine at noon, by bedtime, you don't have any caffeine in your system, no matter how much you've had in the morning. Sure. That's very possible. But how much you have in the morning still matters. Right. Because if you have one coffee in the morning, just for like the taste and a little energy boost and whatever boosts your mood, great. But if you have like five or six, you're jittery, you're running on false fuel, you're 
you know, swiping that credit card with your energy, um, that will impact how you feel during the day and how much you blame your sleep mm. <laughs> with that, you know, energy deficit, regardless of how much caffeine is left in your system by bedtime. Right. Right. Well, and just to clarify for folks, and we won't get into too much of the science here, but caffeine mm-hmm. has a half-life and it's generally between four and eight hours, folks. So half-life means in that amount of time, half of it is out of your system. And, and as Dr. Wu said, that changes for everyone. But if you were that six hour person and you start with a hundred milligrams from one cup at mm-hmm. 6 a.m., Versus five cups, meaning 500 to potentially a thousand, depending on the, the depth of caffeine in your, in your coffee, uh, that, that, that uh, we're talking half of that thousand half of, versus half of that 100 mm-hmm. in this calculation. So anyway, um, let's see any, any other, you, I, I interrupted you. I wanted to get That's more okay. on that caffeine. So any other favorite uh, sleep hygiene components that you think important to talk about here? Yeah. So often we talk about screens and light. And I think a lot of people um, are shy to tell me that they use their phone in their bed and they're like, you're going to think you're going to tell me this is bad, but this is what I do. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to tell you it's bad because actually I use my phone in bed and it's really not as bad as people make it out to be. Because if you get lots of light exposure during the day, You can still be on some screens in the evening and your brain will still know the difference between day and night. So as long as there's a big contrast between how much light there is during the day versus how much uh, light there is at night, then you're good. Especially if you um, just kind of take the edge off of the blue light in the evenings by wearing blue light blocking glasses, dimming your screen and things like that. You're okay. And it's really more... I feel like the content on the screens and the intention Mm, mm. for why you're using the screens that matters, because I think there probably is a difference between reading a Jane Austen novel versus playing Grand Theft Auto. You know, that's two different activities on your screens, Um, even if you're reading the novel on a bright iPad. Um, And also for some people, the Grand Theft Auto might be more relaxing than a Jane Austen novel. So it's also very individual to each person. And also, like, why are you using the screen? Is it because you've had a really shitty day and you really just want to distract yourself and kick the can down the road and deal with your stuff later? Um, Or you are catching up with friends because it's nice to be able to be able to text your friends who are far away. So I think we do need to save time for processing our thoughts and emotions. Um, We should not be using media, social media and otherwise to just distract because if we're so distracted and so kind of kicking the can down the road all day long, then those thoughts that are hanging out back here, wanting to be processed, those emotions, they're going to come out sometime, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if the first time you have a chance to process those thoughts and emotions is when you hit the bed, then of course you're going to have insomnia because those thoughts are coming out to play at that point. Yeah. 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 So a couple of things I want to point out to folks. She said very casually, very kindly, assuming you're all (laughs) doing this, if you're getting direct sunlight during the day, then the screens at night probably aren't that big a deal. Folks, remember the if. If, if, if your if is you get up, you jump in the car, you sit in an office, you get, jump in the car, you sit at the TV and you go to bed, there's no outdoor light in that picture. So then the screens might make a bigger difference. So please, please, mm-hmm. please emphasize at least a little time outside so that her mm-hmm. if then takes a place there. And then I also love what you said about the purpose is more important than maybe the the light itself. Mm-hmm. I, I know in my Twitter account, I've created two different ones. One for following my CSU Rams and our Denver Nuggets. And that's just fun. So there's no stress. Yeah. There's no arousal. It's just like, wow, that was cool what Jokic did last yeah. week or whatever. <laughs> Whereas my standard Twitter is research studies and discussions and more intense stuff. That one I won't open late at night the Nuggets and the Rams. So I I don't see things like that, folks. Keep keep in mind what she's talking about. What do you feel in your gut when you're on your phone? Is it, oh, I've got to get an argument with this person? Or is it literally just scanning through and going, oh, I like those socks or that new weight equipment or whatever (laughs) it might be. So 
That's, that's a perfect example of compartmentalization. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, let me ask you this one more question, then we'll r- pop into a little mini session here. Sure. I, I've, I've bragged about your book already, Hello Sleep, and it does such a good job on some really unique stuff. What are some of the components that you and your editors debated most about keeping or cutting? <laughs> Um, that's such an interesting question. I don't know that there was that much debate because I don't think she'll mind share, uh, me sharing this, but my editor also had some trouble with sleep. So that's okay. why she was excited she to was work on board. with me on this project. <laughs> so she was like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, so there wasn't much debate, but I think there was a lot of interest in the more, um, kind of squishy parts, okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. Like CBT has a reputation for being very regimented, like, you know, don't go to bed until this time, get up at this time. And that is definitely a part of it. That's the big reset. But I think what makes my approach a little bit more unique is the softer things I add in, because I think those are the things that are long-term more important in cultivating your relationship with sleep. Like, um, actually enjoying sleep, like getting out of your head and into your body at night, you know, as you're laying there falling asleep, are you thinking, you know, I should sleep. I need sleep. Sleep is good for me. Therefore I should do it. Or are you thinking like, ah, this feels good. This feels nice. I love my sheets. Like I'm relaxed, you know, I'm wiggling my toes. Hi toes. How are you doing? You know, that's a, that's two very different experiences. And I would really love if people actually just learn to enjoy sleep, Mm. to savor the sensation Mm. more. So that's one example of something um, that doesn't necessarily belong in CPTI, but I think it's just so important. I love that. We just put together a brief, we do a six minute episode every so often. And we talked Mm -hmm. about finding the joy, either finding or adding the joy to whatever you're doing. So if it's an exercise program, stop saying I have to work out instead, find where's the joy in that workout or what joy can I bring to that? If you're volunteering, don't be like, Oh, I got this volunteer thing. Find the joy (laughs) or find a different place with your work. You know, it's all those things. And you're bringing that same concept to sleep instead of, well, I've got to get my eight hours. It's, Mm -hmm. ah, I get to sleep. So I I love that. All right. So we're (laughs) going to transition everybody into a a mini session. And Dr. Wu has been kind enough to say, yeah, let's give this a try. We'll have some fun with it. Um, So take it away. Let's, you've heard a little bit. She's done a little bit of digging as we've started off in the first 30, 40 minutes of this, but Take it away and and I'll just be your guinea pig. Sounds good. So you've already mentioned, Brad, that you have trouble, more trouble staying asleep um, Correct. than falling asleep. Pretty okay. good falling asleep. Uh, usually two, two, three, mm-hmm. I'm, I'll be 57 in a few weeks. So I mm-hmm. uh, have to go to the bathroom usually just once during the night, which is nice. Okay. But then I have trouble falling back to sleep. That seems to be my trigger for mm-hmm. difficulty. Yeah, I think that's the much more common uh, form of insomnia. So you're certainly not alone there. By the way, you look great. Um, I would not have guessed 57 at all. <laughs> and so good job. Thank you. And so how long has this been going on for? It It's something I battled for quite a while. And I think a mm-hmm. lot of it, as I'm hearing you talk, I see it as part of my training. So I love endurance athletics. I've done 11 Ironmans. Mm-hmm. We won the race across America in oh 2016. Gosh, wow. That's just part of who I am. Awesome. But, I, but I've also, as you described, okay, I have my workout time. I have to eat right. I have to do this and I've got to get my eight hours or else. And so <laughs> I think it's become a job. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very, very good observation. I think that insight is a very good place to start because now we can start understanding why you do what you do around Mm. sleep, like that 930 bedtime. Like maybe it feels a bit like this is part of my commitment to my health that I go to bed at 930. No no doubt. Zero doubt. Gotcha. Okay. Are you usually feeling sleepy by the time you go to bed? You know, I've, I've been considering that as I've read your book and mm-hmm. we've started pushing it back to 940, 950. And I mm-hmm. th- think as much as I hate to admit it, I think that's helping. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you're following your body's cues more. You're listening to your body, what it's telling you. I think I'm following your cues. I think I'm <laughs> like, well, she says I should push it back. I'm not really ready to push it to 1030, but let's try 945, 950. Sure. 
Yeah, I, I like that. Just experimenting a little bit with like, well, how does that feel? If you push it back enough and you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm so sleepy. I can't stay. I can't stay on my feet in the evening. That means you've gone too late. Sure. But it sounds like maybe you haven't quite gotten to that part I yet. So maybe, so. Yeah. yeah. So that experimentation is good. So tell me when you wake up during the night, what do you usually do? Like other than going to the bathroom, what is your like internal monologue, what is your emotional tone? What's happening for you? <laughs> um, well, the last few weeks I've been like, all right, let's get that sleep efficiency. Up. <laughs> so okay. do I fall asleep? Do I get up? From... And I have been doing more getting up as you've suggested. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, mm-hmm. folks, one of the things she says in the, in the book is you don't have to get up and stay in a dark room and read something boring. You get up and as she described, if you had an extra half hour in your day, what what would you do? And so I've been journaling or, or reading or, or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. So good. Um, Very good. But my my desire is to get back in bed and fall back to sleep. Mm, that's an that's a very important point you bring up. It's a little bit of a subtle uh, thing, but I think it's an important hair to split what your intention is. So this getting out of bed when you can't get back to sleep thing, it's not meant to be a way to knock you out and make you sleepy again, because getting out of bed, you may very well not feel sleepy for a while. You may not get back to sleep at all. And that's okay. The intention is not to make sleep happen. The intention is for you to actually enjoy your time in the night rather than lay there and be frustrated about Mm. not sleeping. Mm. Because if you're awake anyways, it's better to be doing anything else rather than trying really hard to sleep and being frustrated that you're not in bed. Um, So how does that feel for you? Like, like if I said, just get up and literally do anything and you're not like getting back to sleep is not even on your radar. How does that feel to you? (laughs) <laughs> it it feels like our discussion up to this point has helped my mindset a little bit, but it mm-hmm. feels like had you asked me that 45 minutes ago, I would have said, well, that's kind of like saying you can skip your workout today mm-hmm. or go ahead and mm-hmm. have pie for breakfast or, you know, uh-huh. whatever. It, it's kind of like, yeah, but that's going to throw me off. I won't be because I'm generally uh-huh. a pretty high energy guy. I pretty much uh-huh. sprint from the time I wake up until the time I go to bed. And I love that life. Yeah, And when I don't sleep, at least I've convinced myself, now I'm wondering if it's me or reality, that I'm running at 70%. Mm. So I'm so glad you brought this up because my next question was going to be, what are you actually afraid will happen if you don't get back to sleep soon? Like, let's say you woke up at 2 a.m. Now you're thinking, crap, I have to get back to sleep. Well, what's the other side of the if then statement? Yeah, the other side would be then I won't be able to bring it today. And I think mm-hmm. at this point in our lives, the most important, I can I can do well throughout my day, kind of, I know crutches I can use, but when we have evening activities with our family or we're going to a Nuggets game or going to spend time with our granddaughter or whatever, I want to be on. I, like, I want to be mm-hmm. all me and I my brain naturally goes to, Oh, I'm I'm not going to I'm not going to be mm. all there if I'm not mm. rested. How often have you been not all there or like you know felt like you couldn't actually enjoy your social time or get things done? I think I've created through a wrong kind of CBT, my own created <laughs> CBT. The Brad this is BCBT, Brad's created <laughs> behavioral therapy, (laughs) that Uh if I didn't sleep, then I clearly will not be able to be at my optimal self. So I think I've created a self-fulfilling prophecy Uh that I continue to build upon and it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, just like what you're trying to do of creating bed is a fun, relaxing, sleepy place. I've gone the opposite way of if I don't, then the day I just... It's not all Brad. It's 80% of Brad. It's 70% of Brad. Because, you know, I was going to say, I would be very impressed if you've had insomnia for a long time and you've done your successful career, you have a successful podcast, you've done 13 Ironmans, you've done all this stuff. Okay. So if you don't sleep well, you don't function well, but you haven't slept well for a really long time. No, I go in pockets. So I go in pockets. pockets. I'll I'll have a bad 
seven to 10 days and then I'll be pretty good for two, three weeks. And then I'll, okay. and, and I'll keep thinking I've got it. Like I'll, I'll be mm. like, okay, got it. And then. Er, huh. Still, you're a pretty impressive person. If you, if sleep really has that much of an impact on you and like a third of the time you're struggling with sleep. So maybe I'm making it all up. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I mean, she's nodding at me here with this hmm. knowing look. <laughs> well, I'm I'm just looking very curious. Like, huh, I'm open to the idea. <laughs> she knows the answer. Hmm. Well, I mean, another way to think of it is, okay, here are my questions that I like to ask is, okay, let's the prediction is if I don't get back to sleep soon and get a really good night, then I won't be functioning at my best I, I won't be functioning well tomorrow are there times when you didn't sleep optimally and still actually had a pretty good day and enjoyed yourself or got something done always i have good days i i, I feel it in my eyes first it seems like and i think i've mm -hmm. allowed that to be a cue for fatigue it's like my eyes are tired so mm. i must be tired so i'm probably not fully. And then I just noticed my focus isn't quite as strong as it normally would be. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, maybe it's a cascading effect. It, yeah, that's possible. That's where the self-fulfilling prophecy might yes. come in. Yeah. And also, you know, as uh, I'm sure this will resonate with your expertise and work as well. Um, but the idea that we have selection bias in our memory, like when we think back on our many, many thousands of days of our life, we tend to remember the connections that already confirm mm what we believe. Mm. So if I ask someone with insomnia to think, well, does having bad sleep mean you'll ha have a bad day? They'll say, oh yeah, that one time I had bad sleep and I couldn't perform the next day, that other time that I had a bad night and I felt really terrible the day. But what they're not paying attention to and therefore remembering is all the days when they didn't have good optimal sleep and then went and worked a full day or had fun with their kids or parented successfully or gave that really good talk or whatever it is that they did that day, they're not going to pay attention and remember because, well, so what? Like I had a good day. Okay. You know, but so they're not, uh, so, so like the selection bias makes us focus on those really bad days and those really sensational examples, but we're not really looking at the big picture, sure. which is that probably over the course of your life with insomnia, with sleep problems, you function really well through the vast majority of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. I'm very fortunate on the, ins and I don't know that I would technically have insomnia, but when you mm -hmm. compare me to probably a lot of our listeners, they're like, Oh dude, you're lucky. It's not even close to what I'm functioning with. Mm -hmm. So I get that. Um, at the same time, I think you're very accurate. I think there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy there. And I grew up as a runner. We always had this saying, it's the night before the night before that matters. And oh, we, we would say that ad nauseum. And even my son, who's now in med school at age 24, talks uh -huh. about that with exams, that he would be less worried about the night before the exam than the night before the night mm -hmm. before. And it's so funny because I'm hearing him say what I've said to myself and He's probably heard me in his head, but it's just very interesting that that means I can do it today, but then I've got to get a good sleep tomorrow. So I can be up for mm. that race, that presentation, that interview, that whatever, but man, if this lasts much longer, I'm, I'm going to be hurting. And, and so my, my escape hatch has been the nap, but I hate yeah. it because I, I hate Literally, I know naps are wonderful. I think they're, they can be amazing, but I hate the time spent. I need to be getting stuff done. And if I've got to carve out 45 mm. minutes for a nap. So that's part of my irritation with the lack of sleep in the middle of the night is I'm going, oh, great. Now I need mm -hmm. to, in order to function fully, I need to mm -hmm. carve out 45 minutes to get some sleep. And I don't have 45. Mm -hmm. Where am I going to find 45 minutes today? So I think it's that discouragement. So maybe the idea that, you know what, when it happens, don't worry about trying to schedule a nap. Just do your all that day. You'll build up some more of those sleep drive, sleep drive. pebbles, yeah. you know, what, whatever chips that you were talking about. <laughs> I like that perspective. That's a very valuable perspective because then you start going, okay, cool. No nap. 
more pebbles, you know, or whatever. So, <laughs> and one more piece of reassurance for you is now that you're going to be spending your awake time during the night, whenever that happens, doing something that you enjoy that's valuable to you, that's no longer wasted time. That's not 45 minutes spent just like staring at the ceiling, being frustrated. That's 45 minutes reading your book that you've been wanting to read mm -hmm. or, you know, doing some stretching or catching up with a friend on the West Coast or whatever it may be. Right. Yeah. And one last thought I would want to leave you with, or just I, I would invite you to consider is, you know, I think I've heard you say a lot about the relationship between how you sleep and how fatigued or tired you feel the next day. I wonder if there are other factors that contribute to fatigue other than just how well you slept, slept last night. And if we recognize that how well you slept last night is one slice of the pie that contributes to your fatigue, could we maybe place a little less blame and responsibility on sleep to help you feel energetic? Because then we recognize there are other factors too. Possibly. Uh, we have that conversation mm -hmm. with people that like to blame age for everything. And ah. they're like, well, I'm not as fast because I'm X years old. And we try to bring them back to, well, maybe, because that is a 1% a year after age 40, but how are your speed workouts going? What is your running volume mm. compared to where it was 20 years ago? Are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Are you getting adequate protein intake? Are you So go down that list first, mm -hmm. and then all those things being equal to what you were doing at age 30, now mm. maybe age is playing a 4% impact, but it's not a 30% impact, it's not a 20% right. impact. Stop blaming something that... It, not involved in it. I get the sense you're kind of saying the same thing. Yes. Of, yes. Sleep matters, but it's mm -hmm. not, it's not functioning in isolation. Absolutely. Especially when you factor in that, when you get frustrated and stressed out about sleep, that frustration is exhausting, mm, right? Like that mental gymnastics point. you're playing in the middle yes. of the night, the like, ugh, tossing and turning, the getting very like riled up and, yes. and like beating yourself up. That's exhausting. So yeah. that might be making you tired more than the so-called lack of sleep yeah. is making you tired. Beautiful. Thanks and for coffee. Doing yeah, <laughs> yeah <Sure>. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, this was so fun. Great, great, great job on the book. It's going to make a huge Thank contribution. You. I'm positive. Really appreciate you coming on and joining us. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have that you're like, oh, Brad, we <laughs> missed this really important thing. We've got to get it out there. Any of those things you want to throw out before uh, we wrap it up? Let's see. Um, maybe just real quick. I think often we think of improving sleep as like uh, as like the end of the conversations. Like once my sleep is good, mm. good, like check mark yes. done. Yes. But in my mind, it's like that's kind of the beginning of you now, like fully living your life. So that's why I end the the book with, you know, now that you're sleeping better, now that you're not fighting with your sleep anymore and you're friends with sleep, what are the values and like what are the North Stars in your life that you've, you know, maybe not had the mental capacity or mental space yeah, yeah. to pursue? Like, do you want to connect with people more or do you want to explore your creativity more? Like, let's not just rest on like, okay, my sleep is good now. It's like, what do you want to do with that and feel more fulfilled in your life? That's the ultimate like aim for all of this. Right. So yeah. So I'm you're saying to don't see rest on your sleep. <laughs> I Whoa. don't know if that's quite the <laughs> message. Just, just that I really am excited to see people take their the good step. sleep and go forth with that into their life fully. Yeah, it's a launching point for yes. better than yesterday. Yes, exactly. Love it. Dr. Wu, thank you so much. This was awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. Thanks for tuning into the number one podcast for health and wellness coaching. And thanks to you for sharing it with friends, peers, and others. We've seen more than a 50% growth in our listeners since January. So keep it up. We really, really appreciate it. If you're an employer, EAP, or wellness service provider looking to integrate best-in-class nationally board-certified coaching into your program or platform, Catalyst Coaching 360 might just be what you've been looking for. The ease of integration, value-based pricing, and 17-year history of providing the very best in employee health and wellness coaching makes Catalyst Coaching 360 the choice for so many around the country. Please reach out to us anytime for details. Results at CatalystCoaching360.com. That's results at CatalystCoaching360.com or head over to the website CatalystCoaching360.com. And now, 
it's time to be a catalyst. This is Catalyst Coaching 360's Dr. Brad Cooper. Make it a great rest of your week, and I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst 360 podcast or maybe over on the YouTube coaching channel.